You remember that Savitri is on the, the journey in search of her soul. And um, before actually finding the soul, she encounters the triple soul forces, three powers of the soul. And we are reading about the first one of these, which is the power of divine pity and compassion. And this is embodied in this Madonna of sorrows, the mother of the seven sorrows. And that mother being is speaking to Savitri. Savitri meets her deep in the inner mind. That is where she is seated. And she told Savitri, I am thy secret soul to share the suffering of the world I came. This is what she does. She helps all the suffering in the world by sharing it. But she says, God gave me love. He gave me not his force. She can share by sympathy all the suffering of the world but she is not able to change it. Mm -hmm. So she was explaining all the different kinds of suffering in the world that she is sharing. And the last thing we read about was the animals. Mm -hmm. I have shared the fear-filled life of bird and beast. It's very, very touching to me to read these lines. We see the birds and the animals and they look so nice. We watch beautiful films about them. We don't realize uh, how much <coughs> they have to face in their lives. Sri Aurobindo has expressed it <coughs> <coughs> very poignantly in this sentence. And that shows his great compassion. So now I will uh, continue from line 58. <clears throat> I have shared the daily life of common men, its petty pleasures and its petty cares, its press of troubles and haggard hoard of ills, earth's trail of sorrow, hopeless of relief, the unwanted tedious labor without joy, and the burden of misery, and the strokes of fate. I have been pity, leaning over pain, and the tender smile that heals the wounded heart, and sympathy, making life less hard to bear. Man has felt near my unseen face and hand. I have become the sufferer and his moan. I have lain down with the mangled and the slain. I have lived with the prisoner in his dungeon cell. Heavy on my shoulders weighs the yoke of time. Nothing refusing of creation's load, I have borne all, and know I still must bear. Perhaps when the world sinks into a last sleep, I too may sleep in dumb 
eternal peace. I have borne the calm indifference of heaven, watched nature's cruelty to suffering things, while God passed silent by, nor turned to help. Yet have I cried not out against his will, Yet have I not accused his cosmic law, only to change this great hard world of pain. A patient prayer has risen from my breast. A pallid resignation lights my brow. Within me a blind faith and mercy dwell. I carry the fire that never can be quenched and the compassion that supports the suns. I am the hope that looks towards my God my God, who never came to me till now. His voice I hear that ever says, I come. I know that one day he shall come at last. So this is the first of the three powers of the soul that Savitri meets. The power of compassion and pity. The soul force that becomes aware of all the suffering in the world and prays for it to be healed, but isn't, doesn't have the strength, is not able actually to change anything, only to give sympathy, support, and share the suffering. We're going this way today? This way? Ati, you will read <coughs> line 58, please. I have shared the daily life of common men, its petty pleasures and its petty cares. It pressed the troubles and haggard heart of ill. Earth's trail of sorrow, hopeless or relief. The unwanted, tedious labor without joy, and the burden of mystery and the stroke of faith. Mm, misery, not mystery. Misery, yeah. mm, Misery, yes. yes. Mm. So this is another aspect, just the ordinary sufferings that we all go through every day. Hmm? The, the daily life of common men, ordinary people, hmm? with its petty pleasures, its small pleasures, and its small cares, its anxieties and worries, and all the troubles. It seems as if trouble comes and we find a way to solve it, and then wham, the next trouble is there needing to be dealt with. No? And he speaks about a haggard horde of ills. A horde, it's an angry crowd. So it's as if bad things are hovering around all the time. And he says that horde, that crowd of ills, they look haggard. Haggard is the way that you look when you have a lot of worries, when there's the something, it lines your face, you can see that somebody has a lot of troubles. You know? So I think that the becoming haggard is the effect that it has on the human beings. So, but those ills that come 
they look like that, you know, full of um, cares, trouble, anxiety. So she's experienced all that. She's experienced Earth's trail of sorrow, hopeless of relief. That, uh, the troubles and sorrows where there seems to be no hope of getting better. Mm. And then many human beings have this unwanted, tedious labor without joy. They have to work very, very hard. It's boring, it's not rewarding, it's difficult. Mm. They didn't want it, but they just have to do it. You know? And they don't get any reward of delight for that. And the burden of misery. <coughs> misery, of course, is a state when you feel very sorry for yourself. But I think if we look at it um, in a very, from the root of the word, it, it refers really to living in, a, in miserable condition, conditions, being poor and living in a poor and unpleasant environment and not having much possibility to improve. Hmm? The burden of misery and the strokes of life. Whatever good conditions you may live in by, by grace, uh, still anything can come at any moment and give you a blow. The difficult situation that you have to face, the strokes of fate. So she knows all about all those things. Rosa. Mm -hmm. I have been pity uh, leaning over pain and the tender smile that heals the wounded heart and sympathy making life less God to be. Mm, yes. So this is the role that she plays. She shares the suffering and what she expresses, what perhaps people feel if they are sensitive to her presence is the pity that somebody is feeling sorry for me. Somebody knows what I am suffering. You know? And that pity she's been leaning over people who are suffering perhaps physical pain, perhaps psychological pain. Hmm? And she somehow embodies or carries that tender smile that heals the wounded heart. If you are suffering some, some deep distress, if somebody gives you a loving, caring smile of sympathy, that may help a great deal. Hmm? And sympathy, of course, means feeling with. If you are going through a hard time and you feel that somebody or some people really understand what you're going through and they feel it with you, that makes life less hard to be to bear. Hmm? Man has felt me my unseen face and hands. I have become the sufferer that is mourned. I have lain down with the maggot and the slain. I have lived with the prisoner, his son himself. Yes. <coughs> so she says, human beings have felt my presence near them. Although they don't see me, they felt that I was there. My face, my tender smile, my soothing hands. And I have identified with people who are suffering, people who are in pain, physical or psychologically. I've identified with the sufferer, the one who is suffering, and his moan. When we suffer a lot, we may not be able to help our groaning or moaning. Giving that cry of suffering. 
and there are people whose bodies have been so badly damaged through accidents or because they've been badly treated. They are mangled. Their, their limbs are crushed, severely wounded, or maybe they've even been killed. So at that time of, of being in that state of dying or being recently dead, that feeling of being um, somebody, some loving presence being near is maybe very, very helpful. You know? And I've lived with the prisoner in his dungeon cell. A dungeon is not just an ordinary prison. It's a real deep, dark, underground hole. They put you there and they leave you and forget about you. you know? So at that time, she has given some comfort, some sense of a, a loving presence. I've lived there with the prisoner in his dungeon cell. Boom soon. So we had this word yoke before, no? It's the thing, you, you know, wooden thing you have over your shoulders that helps you to carry a load. Mm -hmm. She's feeling that load on her shoulders, the load of time and all the suffering in time that has gone on for so long and is still going on. No? She says, I'm not refusing anything of the load of creation. I am ready to bear all that load of suffering and sorrow that's in the creation. I have been bearing it, she says, I have borne all, and I know that I still must go on bearing it. That is her role, her mission is to share, to help support all the suffering. Hmm? And she says, perhaps when the world sinks into a last sleep, I too may sleep in dumb eternal peace. She's not uh, looking forward to any immediate release, no. Perhaps when the world comes to an end, then I too may experience eternal peace. Joel. I have borne the calm indifference of heaven, watched nature's cruelty to suffering things, while God passed silent by no turn to heaven. Mm. This is one of the most difficult things for us to understand. No? We've seen dreadful scenes from the Middle East, terrible things happening to people and old ladies lifting up their hands and calling to God and saying, help us, help us. And that they, we don't know, <laughs> it doesn't seem as if God helps them. There seems to be this calm indifference of heaven that says it has to be like this. And she says, I've watched nature's cruelty to suffering things. There's a lot of that, you no? Know? There has to be somehow in the balance of nature. And it seems as if God just passes by. He doesn't turn his head to, um, to help. <clears throat> we see things like that happening and we wonder, why does it have to be like that? So she doesn't really ask why, but she's bearing that sense of helplessness and wondering. But even so, Renana, would you like to read? Yet have I cried not out 
he gets his will, yet have I not except accused. Yes, we might think that you can, some people do feel like shaking their fist at God and saying, what are you doing, you know, and why have you made the world like this? Uh, Dr. Premananda Kumar tells this story about her, I think her grandmother, who used to say, if I could get hold of God, I will tell him how to run this world better. <laughs> and her husband told her, but he's arranged things so that as long as you feel like that, you can't get anywhere near him. <laughs> so, yeah. But still, we might feel things could surely have been better arranged. No? And Mother, of course, says that's how it is now, that's how it has been. But I feel, she says, that it's time for it to change now. And that's what she was working for. Mm -hmm. So I haven't cried out against the divine will. This, this uh, Madonna of suffering, she is surrendered. She accepts. No? I have not accused. I haven't said that God is a great criminal as some people have said. Mahalingam. Only to change great outward pain to pay in prayer as reason from me. The family to say it likes my ego. Within me the brain is a massive blood. I carry the fire that never can be quenched and the compassion that supports the sons. Thank you. So she's not accused God. She hasn't cried out against his cosmic law. But all the time, this patient prayer is rising from her heart. Hmm? A pallid resignation lights my brow. This is the brow, no? And we often feel that people have some kind of light here on their brow, which is an indication of their inner state. So her inner state is one of resignation, <coughs> of acceptance of the way things are, and a feeling of being unable to change. So he says this is pallid, it is pale. Within me, a blind faith. She goes on believing in her God. She, that's, that faith keeps her going. And also dwelling in her is mercy, the wish to help suffering, that suffering should be less. I carry the fire that never can be quenched. To quench is to put out a fire, or you can quench your thirst also. If you're terribly thirsty, you want to drink a lot of water. That fire of faith, of compassion, can never be put out. And I'm carrying the compassion that supports the sons all these many, many suns in the universe, all this whatever's going on here in our material universe, it gets supported by that patient compassion which she carries in her. Helena. <laughs> My God who never came to me till now. His voice I hear that ever say, says, I come. I know that one day he shall come at last. Yes. So she's all these things. She's compassion, sympathy, pity, mercy, faith, resignation. And she says also, I am hope, hope in the divine. I'm the hope that looks towards my God. My God who never came to me till now. 
But she says, I always hear his voice. It's always saying, I'm come, I'm coming, I am on my way, I will come. So she says, I know that one day he shall come at last. This is her blind faith that keeps her going. So this is the description of a particular soul quality, one of three soul forces, soul qualities that we read about in this canto. Bhuvana, what do you read, please? She sees unpleasant echo from below, answering her battles of doom and doom. A walk of wrath took up the dire refrain. A groan of thunder or roll of angry beast. The beast that crouching moans leaving man's death. Of the torture once hmm. So she's expressed what she has to express to Savitri. She stops speaking and immediately there's like an echo. If you speak in a cave, an echo will come. It's the sound of your own voice coming back to you, but it's different. Hmm? So this is like an echo. Um, that's coming from below and it's responding to that pathos, that poignant, touching quality of her voice and of her words, of divine complaint. It is a kind of complaint that she's giving, although she's not really complaining, she's not accusing God. This is divine complaint. Hmm? But this echo that comes is a voice of wrath, of anger. And this takes up a dire refrain. A refrain is the few words in a song that get repeated over and over again. Hmm? The chorus or whatever. This is a terrible refrain. And it comes in the, the vo a voice that's like a growl of thunder or the roar of an angry beast. A growl, that's what dogs do when they are angry, you know, or even we hear cats doing it, tigers and lions, they have that roar and growl. And he says, this is the voice of the beast, the animal, the wild animal that is within our human depths within the lower levels of our nature. It's crouching there like a tiger that's under attack. You know? I was seeing some poor tigers the other day who are in captivity in Malaysia and they're in such a state of rage. You know, Anybody comes near them, they ah! <laughs> so it's something like that. <clears throat> Terrible. This is the voice of a tortured titan, once a god. So this is a fallen divinity, a superhuman being. A titan is a... a, a. Sri seems to use the word as an equivalent of a asura or rakshasa, somebody who's a larger than human scale and um, but centered on the ego, either the vital ego like a rakshasa or the mental ego like an asura. So this fallen God is in our depths. All of us have him there. We can feel him sometimes growling. And Sri Aurobindo gives him very eloquent words to express what that being deep within us is feeling. Bevel, would you read? He's tortured, is, is the titan is being tortured? Yes, he's tortured. He's maybe tortured by his own <laughs> thoughts and feelings, but he's suffering. Just as she's speaking about all the suffering that she's sharing, this is one of the types of suffering. And all her compassion 
and her uh, support doesn't help him. It's no use to that being. Yeah. Doesn't help him at all. And Titans are the ones to guard? Titans, uh, well, <laughs> yes. For we have the idea of there being some fallen angels, yeah. so immortal beings yeah. who have uh, been in a divine state and they've fallen from that for one reason or another. Yes. But in the Greek mythology, the Titans were the rulers, the cosmic powers at one time. And uh, in the early times, in the early stages of evolution, and then they have been replaced by the mental gods, or maybe over mental gods. Mm. The co uh, rulers, the cosmic powers that are ruling the universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am the man of sorrows. I am he who was nailed on the white cross of the universe to enjoy my agony what builds the earth. My passion he has made this glass sea. Mm. So we have this expression, the man of sorrows. We often, or Christ is often referred to as the man of sorrows, the human being, or the divine being in a human form who has taken upon himself all the suffering of the world. Uh, if we look in Sri Aurobindo's correspondence, he mocks this man yes. of sorrows. Yes. Nirod Baran has a tendency to feel a lot of self-pity for himself, and Sri Aurobindo used to try and laugh him out of it, you know, get rid of this man of sorrows who has to, acts as if he has to bear all the suffering of the world. This one, it's, he's full of self-pity. I am he, I'm the one who's nailed on the wide cross of the universe. There's this idea, and it's a mystical idea, many Christian mystics have had it, that the whole material universe is the cross on which Christ is nailed, and Christ as the man of sorrows. And he's, he will be there, nailed, suffering, until the earth is fully redeemed. He, this being says, God has created the world only to enjoy my sufferings. <laughs> yeah. To enjoy my agony, God built the earth. And he's made my suffering, my passion, my intense suffering is the theme of his drama, of his play in the material manifestation. Suresh. He has sent me back into his bitter world and bitten me with his sword of grief and pain that I might cry and go at his feet and offer him worship with my blood and tears. Tears, yes. He has sent me naked. This has two. This word naked means without any clothes. Um, it has two syllables, naked. naked. Yeah. So we are all born naked into the world. When we are born, we don't have any coverings, no protective coverings. And he sent me, he's made me to be born into this bitter world, this world of suffering. And when I'm here, what he does is he beats me all the time with his rods, not physical rods, but rods of grief and pain, just to make me grovel at his feet. And this is groveling is uh, when you throw yourselves at the feet of some strong person and you beg him for mercy. That I might cry and grovel at his feet and offer him worship with my blood and tears. 
the divine that we believe in would never do such a thing. But perhaps there, there's a feeling in these lower levels of our nature that, that that's what God's doing to us and that's what he wants from us. And uh, he, the, he just wants to make us feel small and suffer and to look up to him as something big. But this being feels some sense of revolt. He's not surrendered to the divine. <coughs> hmm? I, um... Prometheus. Kindled. Seeker. Seeker who can never find. I am the fighter who can never win. I am the runner who never touches his goal. And turn Tor torches. Same word again, tortures. Splendor. Yes, thank you. <coughs> so here I have to tell you about Prometheus. In the old Greek mythology, Prometheus is actually a titan. He's one of those old divine beings, but he has love for human beings and he is the one who has stolen the divine fire from the gods and brought it and given it to men to human beings so it might be that he has given men the way to use physical fire but it may also be psychological that he has brought the power of aspiration, the longing for knowledge, like this. Hmm? And then he is punished. He's very, very terribly punished. This punishment which is given to Prometheus is told in the old stories. The king of the gods, Zeus, arranges that Prometheus shall be chained to a rock in a high mountain and every day a vulture will come and gnaw, eat at his liver. He's a divine being, he doesn't die. No. And every night the liver grows again. So the next day, so he's always undergoing this terrible suffering. No. So he says, I'm, I'm Prometheus under the beak of the vulture. And the way I'm the discoverer, man, the discoverer of the undying fire, the inner fire. Hmm? And I'm burning in that fire that I have found. In the flame he kindled, burning like a moth. You've seen the moths, you know, these night butterflies. They, if there's a candle burning, they get attracted to that light. Actually, their little instincts are programmed for them to navigate by the sun or the moon. But now human beings have lit that flame, and instead it gets attracted towards the flame. And if the flame's not protected, the moth will just get burned up. So he says, I'm like a, I, I'm like a moth that's always being burned up in this fire that I have found, this fire of longing for progress, for something better. No? He says, I'm the seeker. The, I'm, that's a typical characteristic of human beings, no? that we are always seeking for something better. But I can never find, I have this incapacity, I have this fighting instinct, but I can never win. 
the whole universe is stacked against me, I will never manage to win. I'm like a runner. I keep on running and running and running and running, but I never reach my goal. Hell, the, the lower vital regions where there's perpetual suffering. I get tortured by that lower power with the edges of my thought. My thoughts are so painful and bitter to me. This is a kind of continual torture. And heaven, the higher levels, torture me with the splendor of my dreams. All human beings have dreams of greater and better and higher things. But that's just another form of suffering because there's no hope of ever achieving them. Uh, Dana Lakshmi. What profit have I of my animal bird? What profit have I of my human soul? I toil like the animal, like the animal die. I am man, the rebel, man, the helpless self. Fate and my fellows cheat me of my wage. Yes. So here I am. My body is like an animal's body. Hmm? <coughs> what good does it do me? And I, I know I have a soul. There's something, some conscious being within me. But what use is that to me? Hmm? I can't, uh, can't enjoy that either. Hmm? Like an animal, like a bullock, or a plow horse or whatever, I, I have to toil, I have to work hard like the animal, and I die like an animal. And yet, I'm human. I'm human, and because I'm human, I rebel. I'm a rebel. I revolt. I can't help it. An animal might just accept. Although, more intelligent animals, they don't. Elephants, sometimes, they they lash out, no? Oh. I'm the rebel, but I'm also man as the helpless serf. A serf is like a slave, somebody who is not free. And uh, I work hard, but I get cheated out of my wages. What I should have earned gets taken away from me, either by fate or by my fellow human beings. They steal it from me. I'll read the next sentence and then we'll stop. Other men, you know, the, the other serfs who are working with me, they steal my wages. Mm -hmm. I loosen with my blood my servitude's seal and shake from my aching neck the oppressor's knees, only to seat new tyrants on my back. My teachers lessen me in slavery. I am shown God's stamp and my own signature upon the sorry contract of my fate. So if I'm like a slave, like a, a, a serf, perhaps I may make a great effort and manage to get rid of my oppressor. Hmm? I loosen with my blood my servitude seal. There have been revolts of slaves and of serfs, and they've managed to get rid of the people who are oppressing them. But then what happens? Only to seat new tyrants on my back. And somebody else will come along and oppress them. It's as if the, they're carrying somebody on their back. He says, shake from my neck the oppressor's knees. You know? You're carrying some heavy tyrant 
on your back. You can't get rid of him. He's holding onto your neck with his knees. You struggle. You manage to throw him off. The next one will come and take his place. There are teachers who try to teach me, to show me a higher light, but they only teach me to be a better slave. They lessen me in slavery. They don't want to teach me to become free. They teach me to accept my slavery. And I'm even shown a contract that I have signed, which um, says that I accept this situation. They show me a, a document, and there is God's stamp on it, and it seems I've signed it myself. No? The sorry contract of my fate. A contract is an agreement. You know? Both people have to sign it. And what a, a sorry contract it is, a dreadful, uh, unacceptable contract. So that is how he feels about it all, this man of sorrows in our lower being. That's how he experiences the world. Sometimes when things are very difficult, we can feel him there growling and weeping and complaining. and. Uh, uh, wondering why he has to suffer like that. Mm. So we'll stop there for today. Mm. We can go back to line 58 and read these lines together. I have shared the daily life of common men, its petty pleasures and its petty cares, its press of troubles and haggard hoard of ills, earth's trail of sorrow, hopeless of relief, the unwanted tedious labor without joy and the burden of misery and the strokes of fate. I have been pity leaning over pain and the tender smile that heals the wounded heart and sympathy making life less hard to bear. Man has felt near my unseen face and hands. I have become the sufferer and his moan. I have lain down with the mangled and the slain. I have lived with the prisoner in his dungeon cell. Heavy on my shoulders weighs the yoke of time. Nothing refusing of creation's load, I have borne all and know I still must bear. Perhaps when the world sinks into a last sleep, I too may sleep in dumb eternal peace. I have borne the calm indifference of heaven, watched nature's cruelty to suffering things while God passed silent by, nor turned to help. Yet have I cried not out against his will, 
Yet have I not accused his cosmic law, only to change this great hard world of pain, a patient prayer has risen from my breast. A pallid resignation lights my brow. Within me a blind faith and mercy dwell. I carry the fire that never can be quenched and the compassion that supports the suns. I am the hope that looks towards my God, my God who never came to me till now. His voice I hear that ever says, I come. I know that one day he shall come at last. She ceased, and like an echo from below, Answering her pathos of divine complaint, a voice of wrath took up the dire refrain, a growl of thunder or roar of angry beast, the beast that crouching growls within man's depths, voice of a tortured titan once a god I am the man of sorrows I am he who is nailed on the wide cross of the universe to enjoy my agony God built the earth. My passion he has made his drama's theme. He has sent me naked into his bitter world and beaten me with his rods of grief and pain that I might cry and grovel at his feet and offer him worship with my blood and tears. I am Prometheus unto the vulture's beak, man the discoverer of the undying fire, in the flame he kindled, burning like a moth. I am the seeker who can never find. I am the fighter who can never win. I am the runner who never touched his goal. Hell tortures me with the edges of my thought. Heaven tortures me with the splendor of my dreams. What profit have I of my animal birth? What profit have I of my human soul? I toil like the animal, like the animal die. I am man the rebel, man the helpless serf. Fate and my fellows cheat me of my wage. I loosen with my blood my servitude's seal and shake from my aching neck the oppressor's knees only to seat new tyrants on my back. My teachers 
lessen me in slavery. I am shown God's stamp and my own signature upon the sorry contract of my fate.